This is the January 25th meeting of the Acquisitions and Dispositions Committee meeting of the Troy Community Land Bank. Um, oh, Teresa just texted back and says she's not able to make it for a couple of reasons, so she must have run to an emergency. Um, I don't remember seeing your email, Brian, so I apologize. Yeah, I told you I'd be traveling and if I could oh, yeah, make got it, it yeah. by the car, and I, if you could share, that would be, if you could just run the meeting, that would be great, because I don't All have right. any ability to see the agenda. Okay, so um, let's see, I'm trying to do something a little different with my notes. So uh, we're calling the meeting to order at 3.39, and um, let me just... And uh, I'll call roll, um, Brian Barker. Here. Janet Nicholson. Here. Albert Watson. Albert walked away. Maybe well, muted. Um, hey, Albert. Albert, you're here, right? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> okay, you just take a good attendance. Yeah. Um, and I see Heather King is joining. Hey, Heather, thanks for making it. Hi, sorry, I'm sorry I'm late, guys. Uh, Kate Hedgeman is here. Tony Tazi is here. Um, Teresa Newton will not be able to join us, unfortunately. Um, Steve Strikeman is here. Richard Herrick is attending, and um, it appears Sherry Cavallaro won't be joining us, unfortunately. So we do have a quorum assembled. Uh, all four members of the committee are in attendance. Um, okay, just got another text come in. So uh, I'll jump into the Legacy City Access Program update. Um, <clears throat> we have tied down our, what we think is our final list of properties. Uh, and it amounts to nine properties. Do you want me to go through that list? Sure. sure. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna try to remember off the top of my head, but that's gonna <laughs> that's not gonna work. I mean, don't give me the don't ask the question. I don't have. I, know, I, I know when I ask the question, what the answer is <laughs> going to be. Um, okay, give me a second. I've got, a thousand files open. Is that it? That's it. So, <clears throat> we have um, 3215 Sixth Avenue, 834 River Street, 836 River Street, 3229 Sixth Avenue, 3236 Avenue, 3209 Seventh Avenue, 3211 Seventh Avenue. 3346th Avenue and 17 Park Avenue is what we have teed up. Um, Teresa has been fabulous in helping me keep the ball rolling forward on this. Um, we had a call a week or so ago with uh, Madeline from uh, Homes and Community Renewal. Madeline's great to work with. She's a former, um, I think, Newburgh Land Bank executive director. Um, so far, there have been three awards statewide. Um, How many? Three, Albany, Syracuse, and I actually want to say Newburgh. Uh, I think they amount to about $5 million. So that leaves 20 million available. The governor has opened it up to municipalities to be able to apply. So it's not just land banks, it's uh, really any municipality. 
Uh, so that's more competition. Uh, Madeline really does not feel like timing is a problem for us. Um, we still think we have, we will have a very, very competitive uh, grant application to take a look at uh, some of the uh, awarded cities. I think Syracuse only had uh, six or seven properties. Albany had, I think eight. And Newburgh just had, I think six. So we'll be coming in with nine. And uh, it, they're fairly well concentrated. So uh, I, I think we're gonna do pretty well, time will tell. Um, we're right now we're trying to move the ball forward but we're also waiting for the ARP funds to be in place. Um, I'm kind of you know, apprehensive to make a move and find out I've done something wrong with procurement. So just trying to play it safe with that. Um, and the city controller, unfortunately has to read 450 pages of new ARPA regs. So God bless him for that. Uh, so let me stop there and just ask if you guys have any questions. When do we anticipate submitting? Um, we would like to submit next month and we expect, we're hoping that uh, HCR will, you know, make a decision in May, maybe June. Yeah, we, we were really hoping that we could have gotten this going sooner, but everything takes longer than you want it to, so. You're just waiting for us to submit? No, no. Um, we're, there are things that we're, you know, we need, need to move the, the ball forward with. So for instance, we have, uh, TAP just developed, um, existing condition floor plans for us. So we have those, we need those, that that's good that we have those. The next step is we need to, um, engage architects to actually do the renovation floor plans and specifications. So um, that's that's the next thing to move forward. Before you submit. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. We who's gonna, HCR, who's gonna do that for you in a month? What's that? Who's gonna do that for you in a month? We think we're probably gonna be using more than one architectural office, Brian. Because you're right, it's it's gonna be a lot of work for someone. Um, so actually I released an RFP that I need to get to Kate to look at. Um, it's on our website to try to attract an architect, the yeah, architects to do that. We'll, we'll see what comes in. Um, we know the, we know of two architects that are interested. One is TAP and the other one, um, I actually, it's uh, an architect that David Downs frequently uses, and I don't know the name of the architect. And, and what's the architectural submission? Is it stamp drawings, or is it just a concept for the property? Well, it's going to be whatever HCR wants it to be. Um, if they want stamp drawings, that's how far we'll have to go. And to be honest with you, that, that may be how far HCR will want the drawings to go. And on the beginning of the conversations with HCR and CPC, it didn't sound like they were going to require all the nuts and bolts that they typically do. But it seems like the more folks on their side of the counter talk about it, the more the typical nuts and bolts are being thrown into the works. So, um, they are expecting a pretty robust um, volume of information coming in, both architectural, financial. Yeah. All, all so, so it sounds like it's going to be an HCR funding submission. Then. It will be, yes. Roughly. So, yeah. Is that, so way, is, that, is that the way you're structuring the RFP? Yes. For the, yes, yes, most for definitely. HCR funding submission. All 
So uh, any more questions on Legacy City? Yeah, jump down to property for sale. Um, so 54 Fifth Avenue and 11 Winnie are listed on the MLS. Jeanette, uh, I did just see it on Zillow, so it's there now. Um, Sherry received a full amount offer two weekends ago on 54 Fifth Avenue. And the person who made the offer wasn't sure if they wanted to live there or not. And I said to Sherry, well, if somebody says that, that usually means they don't want to live there. And it turns out the person lives and owns um, a two family in Albany. So we haven't heard back from that person. Um, but it raises the question, you know, we, we've marketed this as um, owner occupants preferred. Uh, I need to get a feel from the committee as to how strong that preference is. Um, at what I told Sherry, I said, look, I'm gonna try to read the minds of A and D for this one full offer we have. My guess is that A and D is probably thinking, okay, if we receive this offer this quickly, full price offer, let's give it more time and see if we can find someone who will actually be an owner occupant. So if I misread your mind, please let me know because I was trying to do the best I can. No, I, I think that's that's where I would sit, but how much activity has she had on it? Can she send us over how many showings and the feedback? Yeah, I'm sure she for can. Both? I can okay. ask her for that. Yeah, yeah. I, I concur with uh, Heather. My first choice would certainly be to have it go to a, um, somebody who Owner can commit to, yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing that I've been a little bit concerned about is, and I, and I had a really great call with Sherry and her staff a couple months ago about our process, is on this particular pro property, if it is a rental and there's nothing wrong with that, it has to meet the AMI requirements of the, our enterprise grant. So yeah. it, has, it has to be affordable. And so I've always been a little bit concerned that you know, we want to disclose that and explain what that means up front so that we don't get into a contract situation and then they find out later. Mm, so yeah. I don't know what, if anything, Tony Sherry is doing. Maybe she hasn't even gotten to that because it's been more of an owner, you know, an owner occupant type situation we've been pushing. But I think even if it is an owner occupant, they'd have to meet the AMI requirement as well. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there's a covenant that has to go on the property. So um, it does, and I, I've talked about this, you know, with other clients, it makes it a little bit difficult because some people, a lot of people are hesitant about these covenants. So um, it hasn't been on the market very long. It's the middle of winter. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I'd let it ride for a little bit and see what happens. But I think you could take that, restriction off you know don't just see if we can sell it and if we can find someone who will meet the ami then that's what we want to do that's yeah that's what we have to do so what, what i said okay. to sherry we talked about it last week um and i said you know this is uh, kind of a this is definitely a, a first time process for us because we've never had a renovated property that we have put up for sale i said you know we have um we have our um, bylaws that spell out how we review applications. I said, you have your process and the land bank has our process. So you're, you may have someone who is ready to buy the property, but they still need to fill out the purchase application. And when that time comes, I think I need to sit down with whoever that is, with Sherry and her team, so we can walk through the application so that, um, you know, so it's done right. And um, and then bring it to A&D. So, um, you know, for a real estate broker, I'm sure there's a degree of frustration because, you know, they just wanna list it and sell it. And our process is 
just takes longer, as we all know, and as we've all had to explain mm -hmm. to our previous brokers. So, um, so there's that. That's kind of an added thing too. Sherry has said to me, you know, uh, the the person I wanted to put in the full offer. Sherry said um, the the problem with the time it takes to get back to folks with the committee is that those folks are still out looking at property. So that's just a reality. There's nothing we can do about it, but that's that's her reality. So. Okay. Well, I mean, if, you know, I, I think that's easy to say, but we haven't seen an offer yet. So let's say she put together an offer and an application that came in today. You could, uh, and, and this committee could approve, you could sign the contract contingent upon approval of the committee and the board. You could, all right. Um, oh yeah, you Didn't could. Okay. Um, I I rather not, but you could also call a special meeting, right? Quickly. Oh, of course, of course. You know, um, but I think it gives more flexibility. I've done that in the past, where, you know, if it generally meets your criteria, whether it's an owner occupant or it's a rental that they're going to be able to meet the AMI requirements and they're very interested in the property, then I think as long as they hit the purchase price, um, you know, you could sign it and then it goes into, um, well, technically that, that can't work because it's not the um, realtor's contract, it's mine. But we could tentatively accept the offer and say, we're gonna, you know, put a contract out there and then have a special meeting. So Kate, I think, do you think it would be beneficial to have just a a quick email or a conversation with Sherry illustrating that just kind of eliminate some of that frustration. Yeah. And I mean, she, Tony, whoever can help fill out the, the um, application, you know what I mean? So that we would have that and then um, move as quickly as we possibly could. Um, because at that point, I don't, I'm barring anything. The only thing that would really defeat that is, you know, that they can't meet the AMI requirements, right? So otherwise there really wouldn't be a reason why you wouldn't approve it. Um, so, you know, I think that the, they have to put in the offer with the application and then we'll move as fast as we possibly can. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sherry did tell me that she had someone who seemed very interested to purchase 11 Winnie and um, definitely wanted to live there. So um, I haven't heard, I haven't touched base with Sherry since uh, I, over the weekend or maybe Friday. So I'm not sure where that stands. Um, I'll, I'll contact her just to see if that person submitted an offer. At this point, I think if someone did submit an offer, I would have heard from Sherry, but Oh well, yeah, she's got to present it to us within a time frame. Yeah. Okay. So the updates on pending acquisitions. Yeah. So we have our funding from Enterprise Community so we can close on the best of properties the four Vesta properties. Um, I I don't think that we're going to be able to swing purchasing 820 River Street. So um, it's still an important property. It's just that uh, the ARPA budget can't stretch that far to, for us to be able to acquire it and then try to do something with it. Um, it doesn't fit the Legacy City application because it's a uh, it's a rooming house. So it's not one, two or three units. And I think it would be very difficult to make it one, two or three units the way the, the building's laid out. So unfortunately, um, I don't think we can do much with that. I talked to Teresa about it yesterday and I said, hey, you know, this is still an important building. My worry is that um, because it's such, 
because it's a rooming house and there's not a lot of demand for a rooming house, that it could sit there vacant for a long time and slowly deteriorate. So she's um, she's reaching out to Joseph House uh, and a cu couple of other agencies just to see if they have any interest in um, acquiring it from Vesta. Um, so what's the what's the asking price on that one? Uh, boy, I want to say one seventy. I could be wrong. Okay. So um, uh, the other properties, uh, let's see, 814 River Street is the vacant lot that runs from River Street to 6th Avenue that um, Habitat is interested in. And 809 River Street is, it's a beautiful building from the exterior. I have not been on the inside, Teresa has but it was converted by Vesta from three units to five units. It is it is inhabited. So that one, unfortunately, is not going to fit into the Legacy City application. Um, Unknown caller. Sorry. Um, but 834 River Street um, is part of the package and 3215 Sixth Avenue is part of the package. So it's those four, it's those four properties. Okay. And Kate, you're waiting for title, right? Before we can schedule a closing. And for the city properties, I have here a folder that Steve Strykman gave me about two months ago that I need to sign some paperwork and get it over to Kate. So she can run title and we can acquire the properties. Um, there is one property here that I had asked the city um, for me to be able to take a look at before we said definitively yes or no. And that was the one on um, Dow Street. Uh, shoot, it's not Glen Ave. Dow Street? Dow Street, thank you. Um, I think it's 24 Dow. The building is really, a tough building. It's a it's a beautiful building. Has no roof. It's collapsed. Um, so I I don't think that's something that we can take on. I just don't think we have any funding availability to be able to do anything with it. I have had a couple of uh, contractors look at it just to see. Hey, you find can you find a sane way that this would make sense to rent to renovate? And no one has come back to say, yeah, here's a way you can do it. Normally, I would charge more for a skylight. Well, it's a big skylight. <laughs> uh, it's got uh, air conditioning in the winter, too. So you don't want that. Okay. Is that an official you don't want that one? Or yeah. not like I'm going to do anything with it tomorrow, but okay. Yeah. I, I mean, unless there's, you know, unless there's a way we can find more funding. I... I Russ Reeves on a similar building suggested that these that type of building can actually be renovated. Someone would have to saw cut a section of the back wall after they stabilize the building and then just come in with a claw and clean everything out, frame the building, and then, you know, then it's and put up a black wall in the back or a brick wall in the back, and then you could proceed with the uh, full renovation and then you'd have a great building. Um, but, and, and that's what I've said to some contractors who have looked at it, but they're, they all just kind of shake their head. And I think it's just too much of a risk for them. So, but if we're not taking it, Steve, you know, if you find anybody out there who's got uh, a little bit of brave, then maybe they'll do it. Okay. So that's where we're at on properties. Uh, on enforcement, uh, 899 River Street. Uh, I know that um, Tara Small should have mailed the paperwork back to Kate. I received an email from her over the weekend. She was a little confused about who it should go to. And uh, Kate and I took away that confusion. Um, 834. 836 River Street and um, 785 River Street 
Kate issued, uh, or you, I guess you requested a bench warrant, right, Kate? Actually, I should let you speak to this. Sure. Um, as you know, we uh, received a order and judgment from the court to take back 785 and 836 River Street. Um, the purchaser had been, um, you know, MIA all along, never responded to the complaint, nothing. So everything was taken um, in default. And so the court ordered them not only to pay the land bank, but also to deed it over. And he's failed to follow the court order. So I filed a motion to hold him in contempt, which is going to do a couple of things. Number one, um, once it's served, if he doesn't appear, then uh, they will issue a bench warrant and go out and get him uh, at his home and ask him why he hasn't deeded the property back over. Um, there's also a money judgment you know, for from the land bank for your fees and what you've had to do to recover the property, which um, you'd be entitled to, and also the attorney's fees. And um, as part of the contempt, there's also fines that go along with that. So another $1,000 um, asking for him to be fined. In this particular order, because I still don't think despite all of this, he's going to appear or sign it over or anything without the police going to his door. I did put in there that if he fails to do so within 10 days of the court's order, that title vests with the land bank. So what that means is the title company will take that court order and see that the land bank actually has title without recording a deed. And so the, the uh, properties would be insurable going forward to a new purchaser. So um, that motion was filed yesterday and I'm waiting for um, Judge Wack to sign the order to show cause in order to, to serve him. Thanks for getting that done. Honest to God, I've never had to do that before for a client. Like he just, I mean, we have pictures in the process server of them being served. So we know we I, got I, it. I, I saw that. I know. You can lead a horse to water, right? Um, and 822 River Street um, still needs to be inspected. Um, seat has not been available to be able to inspect that. So um, I'll either have to do that myself or make other arrangements to get it inspected until seat has someone ready to go. Um, and I don't think there's any other properties out there that require inspections. So. Uh, so updates on our projects right now. Well, I already talked about 11 Winnie and 54 Fifth Avenue. Uh, 3229 Sixth Avenue, I've already mentioned, is going to be going into the um, LCAP bundle. Seven Park Avenue is um, targeted to be uh, a habitat redevelopment site along with 9-11. Uh, Unknown caller. Um, and 791 River Street, the haunted house. Um, where ha we, we, the masonry materials that we very carefully counted and ordered and had shipped from Westbury, Connecticut, um, did not arrive with what should have been delivered. So we, we have a full pallet of one, sided polished block and that is way more than we should have left over and we have just under a pallet of um special more specialty sized or specialty polished block so somebody somebody definitely goofed up on the delivery the delivery was supposed to come on a tuesday it came on a monday so no one was there to uh even sign for delivery um so I reached out to the person who I'd been working with at Westbury, and who, by the way, I'm sorry, it's Westbrook. Um, the person I, I've been dealing with over there has been terrific up until now. Um, I contacted him back around mid-December and he just replied and said, Here, here's what the cost will be to get you those materials. So I emailed him yesterday and I just said, basically, look, it, it's pretty clear you guys scooped up on this order and I'd like you to call me so we can discuss it. 
and he hasn't replied to the email, hasn't called me, which is not like him. So, um, so Kate, I think uh, you and I talked about it yesterday. I think I'll get you the information that you requested and um, we'll just go from there. So it's very frustrating because, uh, you know, we had Bolton Construction. He put a structure up so he could heat the space as needed to continue on with the masonry. And when he started to do that, that's when he realized all the special pieces are not there, or I should say not many of them. So um, so that's, that's where we're at with 791 right now. So that's what I got for you, for you guys. Tony, any updates on uh, the uh, RPI MOU? No, um, nothing at all. I haven't heard from, from anyone, Brian. Well, I think the last thing we heard on that, Brian, if I recall correctly, um, they wanted us to take all liability and did not want their students signing releases to enter the building. And their lawyers really um, chewed up what I had sent over that we're, we were gonna require. So I think um, it's probably dead in the water um, only because they not only did they not accept what I had put in there, which is just pretty lightweight stuff, you know, we don't we want the students to know it's, you know, be, be warned, you know, it's not in great shape and it's at your own risk. And not only did they um, take that out, but they tried to put all the risk for us to indemnify and defend them. And I was like, you're out of your mind. So um, I think that's that's yeah. RPI. Right, but the, most of the program is new construction, and RPI students get up, go on construction sites all the time um, through Habitat, through their own design development classes. So I'm not sure why we're making the case so hard on the existing building because that's not the program we're really trying to push. It's the new construction program yeah. that we're really trying to push. And that's well, through habitat. But it's habitat, but it's a, it, it's all part of the same agreement. That's the agreement is for both new construction and you know renovations. So that's the. I mean, I suppose we could pull it out, you know, for the new build, and that it doesn't have to really require all that. But if they were going to be in any of our buildings, we need ba we needed basic requirements. And not only did they not want to agree to that, they wanted to put it off on the student and then asked us to indemnify RPI and the students. And I was like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> so I don't know what's going on there, but you're right. It's over lawyered. It's over, you know, I don't know why, but it is. And what they sent back, we just couldn't accept. They also had a note in there, a comment that um, really kind of surprised me. And it said something to the effect that um, they can't allow their students to go into buildings that are unsafe. And given that these are all vacant buildings um, without a permit, it kind of really goes, uh, you know, very much against the grain of what we're trying to do. So um, I think somebody needs to talk to RPI's attorney and get them back to earth. Yeah, for sure. It's yeah, just, it's really the agreement really changed a lot. Yeah, but aside I mean, from it, that, it, the, but oh, there's a code that in, in the partnership, right? In the it, this is a memorandum between four parties: our Habitat, TAP, us, and RPI. And when there's a project where we're turning over a site to Habitat, there's some kind of code dev agreement at some point, right? And doesn't Habitat take control of the site at that point? Yep. Only if they own it. But I think they would have to in a normal project, right? Well, yeah. yeah. Before they it get depends. Building, sure. Yeah. So it's almost a non-issue. I mean, our, our, the, the land bank's role in that partnership is just to provide sites 
we're not doing anything else. We're handing sites to Habitat and TAP and RPI to, to, to develop. I, Brian, I think the problem with the agreement is that it also includes the vacant buildings. And, you know, the students do want to get into the vacant buildings to be able to, you know, measure them up, uh, get a feel for what's there uh, so they can, you know, do their, their portfolios. Um, and that's where everything, well, that's, that's part of where everything kind of just got mucked up. I do, uh, there was an email that went around about a month ago. I think it might've been by Barb Nelson. Um, and I am pretty sure Brian that you were on it um, and it had something to do with the agreement. And I think Barb was, I think Barb was saying that um, she wanted to take a closer look at it. I could be wrong, but that's, that's the last bit of information that I recall at all about, uh, about the agreement. It kind of um, sounds like we have to put our heads back together and just get it to move forward again. Yeah, it just, yeah, yeah it, it sounds like it is. It's over lawyered. It's like, it's yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think I like that. I like that term. <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 TAP, Habitat, and Land Bank have been doing projects. The only difference is RPI School of Architecture providing some design leadership and you know, Habitat yeah, has volunteers in their construction sites all the time. Yeah, but right? the problem is has, where we own it. Us. But it does where we own it, even if it's vacant land or where they come, you know, into a building. And that was our understanding from the get go is that's what would have been happening. So when I was asked for edits, that's what I put back. Hey, no problem, but we're going to need indemnification. We're going to need a waiver. We're going to need all of that. And Habitat asked for the waivers too. And when they came back at us, it was, no, you need to indemnify us. And the students are going to be on their own. Like we're not, they, they're going to have to, uh, you know, sign their own waivers. If we don't own the property, what, but I don't see how that can be because why would we be part or party to the agreement in the first place? But if we own it, there's premises liability. And if it's vacant, you know, and, and could be dangerous, then we have to have all that in place. Enterprise requires it too. So that's yeah. the assumption. Yeah. If, if it's just new build, we probably could take that out and do something similar. But again, if they're going to do a site visit, um, you know, and be yeah, on, yeah. The, on the premises, then that's a different story. Yeah. I mean, there is an RPI chapter of Habitat. <laughs> and I'm sure Habitat gets releases when that, when that club goes on their sites to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a feeling whichever attorney got this really didn't know much about it and just said, nope, you know, we're not getting, it was almost the way it was drafted was almost like, we don't want to be a part of this. <laughs> that's the, that's the way I felt yeah. when I read it too. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll try to poke around. <laughs> I'd like to see it move through. It seems like, yeah. I mean, the, the, the urban studios, it, they're doing stuff. So it's like, I know. We'd like to get a project going this cycle. So yeah, there's a disconnect somewhere. Well, for, for the park app sites, they, they do, I mean, you, we have designs for that. So at least at least that's there. Um, I know they came up with designs for the uh, 806 through 812 River Street lots. So um, it, it's really the vacant buildings. Yeah, which I'm not sure will ever result. I mean, it, the, the vacant building part of it is research. That's a, like a I research know. component. It's not like a, const a construction project necessarily unless Habitat takes the building and does it. No, no I, I, I totally understand, but there's the provision in the agreement that says what it says, it doesn't distinguish between a vacant lot. It, it really just says what it says about liability and it's all one agreement. So it's not 
two agreements, one for vacant lots for new construction and one for uh, research for, vac for vacant buildings. Um, it's all one agreement. Right. Or I should say memorandum of uh, understanding. Right. Okay. I don't, I don't want to hold the debating up. I'm just, okay. I'm just curious. Um, well, that's, that's everything I've got. So I don't know if any, if you guys want to chat about anything more or if you want to just go ahead and adjourn, adjourn the meeting. So I'm okay with I'll make a, yeah, I'll make ahead. a motion to adjourn. Okay. I second. Okay. Second. We're still doing exactly after this, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Did did I hear a second on that motion? Brian. Yes, I yeah, see. Brian. I second. Okay. Yes. Thanks. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Meeting is adjourned at uh, four eighteen p.m. Okay. And yeah. so now we just uh, the the uh, we have to wait for four thirty. For executive to start, so I'll uh, pull us out of this Zoom meeting, and then I'll see see you all at uh, four thirty. Have okay. a good afternoon. All right, thanks, Jeanette. Thank you.